Lovely. <laughs> So Michael Palin, thank you ever so much for joining us on this special digital HIST Fest. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to have you involved. Um, I know that I am probably going to be the envy of lots of people being able to talk to you for even just 20 minutes, but um, it's wonderful. Thank you. Um, so we're here to talk about your book about the HMS Erebus. Um, and it's such an incredible story. Um, it's it's one of those stories that you, you read and you just can't help but read more and more and more because there's more to it. Um, but I wonder if, first of all, you could perhaps set the scene. So we're in the early part of the 19th century. What's the world like um, where, you know, in which Erebus exists? Well, Erebus, Erebus was um, built shortly after the end of the Napoleonic War. So a long period of very, very... Um, uh, damaging and, and vicious and, and, and expensive war was over. Um, and for a short while, about thirty year, next 30 years, there was general peace across the world. The Age of Enlightenment had encouraged people to look for reasons why things were the way they are, rather than just take them and accept them. So it was a great age of science. And um, into the middle of this came Erebus, which was actually built as a warship. It was built as a bomb ship with a very strong um, uh, hull in order to take the recoil of mortars which they had on, on deck. But there were no wars to fight, so really it was redundant, <laughs> as were a lot of ships that had been built during the Napoleonic War. But because it had been strengthened, um, its hull had been strengthened, it was chosen um, to go to the Antarctic in 1839 for an expedition which was actually embodied all the spirit of the times. It wasn't a commercial expedition particularly, it certainly wasn't a military expedition. It was an expedition to try and understand better the world in which we all lived, and particularly the southern continent, which no one really knew existed and, and no one knew, people knew very, very little about. So essentially it was a, a little ship going into the great unknown. I mean, it's, it's crazy with our 21st century mindsets to think that there were parts of the world that were genuinely unknown and unfamiliar. And to have the gumption, I suppose, to get on board a ship that's going to a place, and, you know, where you wouldn't know what was what was going to happen and what you were, you were going to find. What kind of men and um, were there any women on, on board this ship as it set sail for Antarctica? No, no, definitely no women. Oh, right. I a slight feeling that women were unlucky on board. <laughs> I've never gone into that really, but it was definitely a sort of feeling. Anyhow, it was, a, it was an all-male ship. Um, it was uh, under the command of a man called James Clark Ross, and they had a sister ship called Terror. Both these ships were given names to frighten people, really, because it was a bomb ship. So Erebus and Terror. Um, and Francis Crozier commanded uh, HMS Terror. It was very much run along naval lines. There was a, there was a hierarchy. Also very important were sort of naturalists, botanists. Mm. Um, and they, they understood really what was, was vital was to acquire as much information as possible. So they stopped on their way down to just to Tasmania um, at, at uh, little islands in the southern Indian Ocean with these huge gales blowing, it was almost impossible to put into these islands because the wind was blowing them along so fast, but they did, they stopped and they took soundings, they took readings and they made um, uh, little drawings and, 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 and just generally sort of all along the way they were discovering new things and I think that's what kept them all going, this was a sort of you know, they, they, were, they were the first to understand these things and certainly once they were in Tasmania that's where they sort of refueled before going down to the Antarctic. Once they went, once they left Tasmania, they were really um, on their own and they were finding things out that no one else had, had really found out before and detailing it very, very carefully. So there was a great feeling, I think, of being pioneers. And part of an adventure. I mean, I've always felt, because I've researched the 17th century and a lot of what draws people to the sea and to ships is this sense of adventure. Yes. Um, and I wonder as well, this ship obviously fits into a time period where we're coming to the end of the age of sail. How did that, how would you have seen that physically on, on board Erebus? Um, was it, was it mechanised in ways that ships hadn't been before? 
No, Erebus was a sailing ship. Um, on the journey to the Antarctic, it uh, was all undertaken by sail. Their circumnavigation of Antarctica in the storms, in the wind, through the ice, it was just a sailing <coughs> ship and quite a small one at that, only 104 feet long. They did, when they went to the Northwest Passage, which is the sort of last part of my book, um, then uh, small motors were installed. It was a very much the, the start of uh, motorized uh, navigation and they weren't particularly useful or helpful in the trials, but they took them anyway because they thought it might help them through the ice. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know if it did or not, but uh, they, they were very much, that was, the, that was on the cusp between sail and, and, uh, and engines and steam. And so if we move to the next, the next part of Erebus's story then, um, um, I just wonder if you could tell me a little bit about Sir John Franklin and how he, fit into, how he fits into the story of, of Erebus. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> yes, well, um, Sir John Franklin was um, an acknowledged explorer of his time. I mean, he'd actually, he was much older than Ross, who commanded Erebus on the way to Antarctica. He'd actually been in the Battle of Trafalgar, um, John Franklin, was about sort of an 11 year old. People joined the Navy at incredible ages then, yeah. It was like going to school and college. You joined the Navy at the age of 11 or 12 and you stayed in the Navy through to your 40 or 50. Anyway, this had happened to John Franklin. He had uh, unfortunately run out of ships to command. He was sent to Tasmania as um, the uh, Lieutenant Governor there. That didn't work out. It was very political things didn't work out. They didn't like him out there. They didn't like his wife, Lady Jane, particularly. <laughs> um, when they get back, when Erebus and Terror got back to London after the, the very successful Antarctic voyage, um, Clark Ross didn't want to go to sea again. He'd had enough. Uh, so they looked around for who was a, a, a name that could, could uh, take his place. And Lady Jane said, oh, my husband, you know, he can do this. <laughs> Chance to restore his reputation after what had happened um, in Tasmania. But he was 59. Everyone said he's too old for this. Especially, it's a very it's a difficult job. And no one's ever been sailed through the Northwest Passage before. But he got the job. And... He was apparently, he was a lovely man to travel with. He was very friendly and he was very chummy and very clumbable. Um, whether his actual um, abilities as a sort of captain were, you know, were, were, were good enough then, we don't know. He wasn't at the peak of his career. He was mm. towards the end of his career. Anyway, there he was. He was popular with the men. And as far as we know, um, when they left Greenland and sailed over the horizon and no one ever saw them again, um, he, was, uh, he was very optimistic, as they all were, that they were going to find the Northwest Passage. But then the next thing we know, of course, is that Franklin died um, in 1847. And I, I, I wonder as well about, I mean, it's very hard when it comes to shipwrecks. It's almost you, you kind of piece the story together after the event. But are there any, any scraps of information that we have about what happened to them during this time? Well, it's quite difficult to, to get the, the, the chronology of it right. We certainly know because there are two written records called the Victory Point Notes, the only written records of what happened to them um, at the moment. And they made it clear that they had abandoned the ships and uh, travelled south, obviously, to try and look for for, I don't know, a sort of um, a trading station or um, an estuary which they could sail down. Um, so we know that they'd left the ships um, and that most of them died after that. We just know again from the, from the note later on that a lot of lives had, uh, had, had been lost. Um, but what we don't know now is actually whether they came, some of them came back to the ships they'd abandoned. And this is a very key part of the research they're doing now. Did people come back? Were the ships actually, did they spend yet another winter after about, I think, three winters, four winters mm -hmm. up before? Did they spend another winter there before, we all know they died in the end, uh, all of them died in the end. But there might well have been a chance for them to mix with the Eskimos, trade a little uh, when they got back to the ship. So a few may well have survive for another another year but we have no again no written records at the moment at all which is very frustrating for all who want to know what happened in this dreadful story 
but it leaves you, I suppose, with your, your thoughts and imagining what it must have been like. I don't know whether it would have been better to have, to have, you know, left this earth earlier or whether to have survived for another winter in such conditions and seeing people around you get sicker and sicker and sicker. It's, um, it's a real tragedy of a story. It, it is really. And, and part of the real tragedy to me when I was researching the book is that the Inuit um, were really a very important part of the story. We know from Inuit testimony where the ships sort of were. But the Inuit testimony was disregarded at the time because there's no written uh, tradition. So it was just, oh, I remember this and I think I saw that. And people say, oh, this is not good enough. But actually in the end, where the two ships were found in 2014 and 2016 was almost exactly where the um, Inuit uh, oral history said they would be. So I feel that if they had been able to interact with the local Inuit, things could have been very different. Lives could have been saved. They didn't, they didn't, really, they weren't geared for that. They were in a ship which had everything, you know, everything was there for them. They had the equivalent of a cinema and a gym, but they had libraries, they had workshops. They didn't need to, to do, go anywhere else apart from the ship. And yet I think if they had been taught how to get off the ship, how they might need local people and their help, things could have been very different. And this was something I'm afraid of the sort of kudos of the whole thing. It's, it's a really, really sad story. And I, I wonder yeah. how, how you came to it. I mean, you've obviously got, you've had a, a, a huge career and you've done so many different things in your life, but history seems to be this common, common thread throughout. Um, and I wonder how you came to this particular story. I was asked to give a talk at a club in London about a member of the club in history who I thought was interesting. I chose a man called Joseph Hooker, who was actually a botanist who became sort of, he founded Kew Gardens really, and, the, uh, and, and was, it was enormously sort of um, important in, in uh, the botanic and natural history world in the, in the 19th century. And I, I sort of looked, looked to us reading through and um, I discovered quite extraordinary that at the age of 21, this young man had signed up to be assistant surgeon on a ship that was going to the Antarctic. I mean, everything about him seemed to be the archetypal Victorian. He sat there rather stuffily, very straight laced with little glasses on and all that. I thought, oh, well, you know, this man spent his life behind a desk. But he went on this ship and then I read a bit more and I thought I didn't know anything about this expedition. And it was an extraordinary expedition. I mean, you know all about Drake and you know about Raleigh and you know about the terrible disasters like Titanic or whatever, but you really don't know about the successes. And I thought, this is an amazing success and no one's told the story. So that's what got me more involved in the Erebus than Hooker in the end. So Hooker got you hooked. <laughs> Hooker got me hooked. And he very good he was too. He kept, he kept journals and journals on board ship were very, very important at this time because the officers and the men on board ship, the officers had all their journals were passed on to the Admiralty at the end. They couldn't write anything confidential. All had to be seen because they were, they were naval men. But if you weren't part of the Navy and Hooker wasn't, he was just, he, he was just there as, a, as a, a naturalist and assistant surgeon, then you could write freely. And he wrote freely letters home to his father, which were absolutely fascinating. And also kept a diary of the journey itself, as did two or three others who were not um, enlisted men. And oh, okay. so owe them an awful lot really. Otherwise the other diaries are a little bit more sort of, um, you know, got up sort of speed of the wind, uh, depth of the sea, you know, the sort of uh, traditions and the clouds and all that. But uh, uh, Hooker told a lot, of, a lot more about what life was really like and what their expectations were like on board ship. Fascinating. I love, I love the fact that you can, at this point in time, you can go on board a ship as, a, as an assistant sur surgeon, also a part-time na naturalist. <laughs> yeah, well, the thing was that, that there, was a, there was a reason for that because, um, you know, uh, herbalism and botanism, botany and all that were very, very important to medicine at that time. There were no sort of chemical, uh, uh, pharmaceutical medicines around. They were all based on plants and what they could do and the efficacy of plants. So if you were a doctor or a surgeon, you really needed to know exactly what you were dealing with and what kind of plants, uh, from which plants you get, which solutions which would help people and all that. So there was a, that was the that was the connection. Right. Okay. Okay. And um, the other question I had for you, and um, I know we've we've got a limited window of time, so I'll try and be quick. But the other question I had was. 
while you were researching this book, I'm curious to know whether the excavation of the shipwreck was going on at the same time, and if it was, how that fed into your research, because it would have made the process slightly more well, lively, I imagine. No, the, the, <laughs> the discovery of Erebus was in September 2014. I hadn't really decided to do the book then, I just there was a story was sort of going around in my head. When I heard about the discovery of the ship, I thought, this is it, this is a sign, this is the big finger coming down from heaven, I'm telling you, this is the time to write the book. So I was writing the book at the time as when, when Erebus had been discovered, and it gave it a sort of edge, because they could only look at the vessel um, for a very short period of time in the summer when the ice melted and they could send divers down. So it wasn't as if they discovered the ship and they found out everything about it and they could dive rather than like the Mary Rose or anything like that. No, they had a very, very tight window of time. And um, in some years they, they didn't, you know, it was iced over and they couldn't get down at all. So you were, little tiny things were coming out, little glimpses of the ship, fascinating. They got the cameras down and you saw the sort of heavily sort of barnacle hull and kelp covering it all and all that. So that, that just fed my fascination, and I think it was, it was a good bit of timing that. Uh, well, it's, that yeah, it sounds amazing, and I just, I just was doing a, a bit of um, Googling ahead of our meeting, and just to look at some of the objects that they've managed to pull up from the, um, the wreckage, and they're just fascinating. There's one that I didn't manage to see, but they referenced that there's, um, they found a wax stamp with a fingerprint in it, and it's just those tangible pieces of history. Yes. Yes, no, absolutely. It's sort of, uh, well, a lot of crockery they found. And just recently on Erebus, this just in uh, 2019, which was a very good season and very good weather for diving in 2019. And they found like 13, a stack of 13 willow pattern plates, beautifully done, with not a single scratch or crack or chip on them at all and these had gone down with the ship 170 years ago and were still stacked there you know amazing goodness me um well this has been an absolute pleasure and i just have one final question for you before i leave you to the busy life of um um quarantine <laughs> <laughs> Um, so as I mentioned before, history from Monty Python to the books that you've written, even the travels that you've done, seems to have been, from my point of view anyway, a thread that's, that's run throughout your career. If you had 24 hours to go back to any time period, ever, um, where would you go to, why, and um, what would you do? Well. You know, it sounds gruesome, but I'd quite like to go back to the First World War because I've always been terribly fascinated by that, uh, you know, just how it happened and how so many died um, in, in such a sort of profligate way. And um, my great uncle Harry was in, in the war and died at the Battle of the Somme. And, you know, in many ways, I'd just like to go backstage before these battles and before one of these battles and find out what people were really feeling what was keeping them going. Were they terrified? Were they just cock a hoop that they were going into battle? What was happening? Because I'm, I think it's close enough to to our own times to sort of understand a little bit, little bit about the people involved. And certainly, my my great uncle Harry is is had is fascinating character. Gone to New Zealand and come back and fought both at Gallipoli and the Somme. It's really, I'd love to know what they were thinking and also what the officers and the people conducting the war were thinking when they sent so many thousands of people into the machine guns and all that. What, what was going on, you know? Wow, are. that's um, a very full-on experience. I think, I think I'd probably go and see um, Beethoven's, one of his performances. <laughs> You're going to f for full-on war. <laughs> well. I'd, I'd like to think I was invulnerable, you know, if I was coming back in history, I'd be all right. I wouldn't actually get shot. If I could hover there somewhere and just eavesdrop. I think history, a lot of history is eavesdropping. I loved it when I was doing the Erebus book. You were just getting to know a little bit about these people on board the ship. And honestly, by the time I'd finished it, I felt quite moved because I thought, you know, I've given these people some kind of um, uh, extra sort of time you know, people people now know who they were, uh, who they didn't before. They were just a lot of names, or not even names. 
and that was rather good. It's like sort of you, you kind of feel they're almost there. Hey, we're, we're all in it together. You know, yeah, that was 170 years ago. But that's that's the job. That's the job, isn't it, of a historian? You you do you kind of lift these people. I don't want to say from obscurity, but in a weird way, you get to play God slightly to lift people and extend their immortality slightly um, by just saying their names and researching them. Exactly, and you give them you give them an identity which they all had at the time. That's the great thing. I mean, far too often, I think we just write people off. Oh, well, that's history. You know, they're, they're all dead now and they're all finished. But what? What were they like at the time? They were all different people. They lived in different circumstances. They had wives, friends, lovers, children. But, you know what? What really was going on in, in, for each person? I mean, it's almost limitless the appeal of history. I think. <laughs> well, on that note, there's a perfect quote to end end on. And um, I would just like to thank you so very much again, Sir Michael Palin, for your time and for being so generous to um, give up part of your day today to chat about Erebus and your work. Well, it's a lovely thing to do. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Thank